Yes, everybody, welcome back to TarHillIllustrated.com. Or, of course, if you're watching on our growing YouTube channel, that is Tar Hill Illustrated. I'm THI staff writer Jacob Turner, and joining me as he always does, our very own publisher, Andrew Jones. And, Andrew, we're here for the Notre Dame edition of the preview podcast with Carolina set to travel up to South Bend this Saturday, 7.30 p.m. kickoff. That game will be televised on NBC. Before we dive into it, though, got to plug the website real quick, tarhillillustrated.com, which you can see right above us right there. Make sure you guys head on over to tarhillillustrated.com. You can sign up for just eight thirty three dollars a month. It's a great time to do so. Basketball season is just around the corner. I mean, it's, it's very, very close within touching distance now. And obviously, peak football season, recruiting is a 365-day-a-year thing. So if you want a little bit more insight to what's going on and all those things, and a lot of our stuff is not free. If you want access to our premium boards as well, sign up just eight thirty three a month. You can find the link in the description below. But, AJ, let's dive into this one, man. Uh, obviously, like I said earlier, Carolina Notre Dame, big game this weekend on Saturday. Um, before we kind of dive into this matchup a little bit more, dive into North Carolina, dive into Notre Dame in more detail, want to hit on a few of the transfers because we – Choffrey Brown obviously transferred within the bye week. We did a podcast on that. But we haven't hit on the two other ones yet or haven't talked to them – excuse me, talked about it on a podcast yet with Clyde Pender and Josh Henderson, the other two guys that, that have left the program and, and decided to enter the transfer portal. So, AJ, kind of give me your thoughts on tying those guys in, those guys leaving, but also – it, with that kind of where this team and where this program is right now with losing those guys. Well, Choffer had one reception, Pinder played 28 snaps through seven games and Josh Henderson had five carries. So, and, and I'm not demeaning them in any way, shape or form, but they weren't exactly being asked to do a lot. Choffer, I think was asked to do some things that he just wasn't able to do. Yeah. He had 15 receptions last year for 337 yards, a couple scores. He's a, a big play kind of guy. But in order to make a big play, you got to catch the ball. In order to make a big play, you got to get open and run the right route and be open and then catch the ball and then take off and use your gifts. And, yeah. and he didn't show that he could do that. So the three of them made decisions to go somewhere else and, and go somewhere where they will be able to have a chance to play more. And it was probably good moves for all of them. I think Choffrey will get an opportunity – uh, at a power five because he's such an amazing talent. Oh, yeah. I don't know about Josh and Pinder. Um, you know, they were, all three were four-star kids. It just goes to show people about recruiting that star rankings, they matter, but they don't matter. You know, they matter until you show up. And then once you show up, the coaches don't care. They're not going to play a four-star over a three-star because he was a four-star. And that's one of the reasons coaches don't make promises to players, or at least the smart ones don't, because hmm. you never know what you're going to get. So what does this mean for the program? Everyone's losing guys. The NCAA has made it possible for players to bolt whenever they feel like it's time to bolt. Mm -hmm. Mac told us in advance of the open week, they were going to have honest conversations with every member on the roster about their futures. And some of them didn't like what they heard. They would rather play. Uh, he did say uh, Wednesday, no ill will. I mean, it, there was no anger. There was no, um, no animosity. Mm -hmm. It's just, okay. You know, it's business. It's life. You get, you learn that in real life all the time. Oh, yeah. These kids have had the opportunity to learn that. I think it's good for them. They get a chance to get out there and, and start talking to other schools. They could, heck, Clyde Pitter could take an official visit somewhere this weekend if he wants. Yeah. Yeah. So it's good for them to get a head start on that. And for the program, with roster management being such a bear now, this helps the program know what kind of spots, A, how many they're going to have open and where they need to get things filled. And I do think they're going to look at the portal a little bit harder this time around than they did last year because you just can't build a program through recruiting anymore. You'd like to, that is optimal. But I think uh, unless you're Ohio state Clemson and Alabama, where you're loading up on uh, nothing but four and five star kids where you have enough that if half of them pan out, you still have a, a very healthy, deep roster of, of players in your rotation. The rest of them are going to have to use the portal some, and that includes Carolina. So I think it helps the kids and it helps UNC. And as far as this team goes, Jacob, I think sometimes, you know, you shake the tree a little bit, you shake the foundation a little bit. That can be good. Uh, mm -hmm. But I believe more than that, the bye week, having a chance for Sam to get healthy, to rest his body. He said he feels very, very fresh, feels great. And he needed that week off. Okay. I think that, 
is uh, came at a great time for this club. Mm -hmm. And really, they got a chance to go into the bye week with a winning record, coming off a win. And as bad as the defense was against Miami, you know, their slogan, be the one, Cedric Gray was the one. He stepped yeah. up and made a play, made two in that game, really made more than that. But he made a play at the end, saved the game. They got the win, stick it in your back pocket. 45-42 looks the same in the standings as 55 to nothing does. Yeah. So exhale, reset, and now they got an enormous set of challenges coming up, beginning with Saturday night on the hallowed grounds of Notre Dame. Most definitely. Uh, real quickly, I want to stay on that just for a second because I wanted to ask yeah. you this, and you already hit on it a little bit, but – do you think that the bye week when it came, obviously coming after a win over Miami, kind of almost right at that midpoint of the season, do you think it kind of came at a perfect time for this club? In August, we talked about this. I said, what a terrible time for a bye week. <laughs> I said, coming off Miami, boy, if they're undefeated, yeah, you they're going to Notre playing. Dame and Heisman hyper on Sam. Last thing you want to do is have all that extra time yeah, to, to think, think about, about it. it. You just want to stay in routine. But I think now – since whatever script we looked at in August has been burned to the ground and shredded, uh, I think now, given the way the first seven weeks have played out, given the injuries on the offensive line, how much Sam has been banged up, and the fact that it allowed them to sort of flesh things out last week mm -hmm. uh, is actually good. It came at a good time. So they didn't spend last week thinking about Notre Dame. They did work on Notre Dame a little bit. They had a lot more to worry about than Notre Dame. So now they get into this week, they had a chance to exhale, which is so incredibly important when you're in the middle of a grind. It can mean so much to a group. They're fresher. I think their spirits probably up very high this week. Max said Wednesday morning, they've had a very good week of practice. So they're probably in better position to go up and compete and possibly win this game now than if they played anybody this past weekend. So I think the bye week came at an excellent time plus you know, Mac is going to use the bye week to do that roster management stuff, to talk to the kids about their futures. And if the bye week is in the third or fourth week of the season, you haven't played enough to really get a handle on where some kids are in the program. If, you know, you there are some players where coaches might not be sure if they can help down the road or not, if they're just going to be special teams players. But seven games in, especially with the kids that have left, you know, Henderson's been around a while. choffrey has been around a while. Pinder's in his second year. They, they, they had a really good idea of where those guys stood in the program. So it gave them an opportunity to make decisive uh, moves with them and for those kids to also make decisive moves. So I think the bye week came at a really good time for this club. Most definitely. Yeah, I completely agree with that too. Um, I, I think it was an ideal place for it. Like you said, with the middle of the season, exhaling and, and just trying to reset. So, Let's dive into the matchup a little bit more. Notre Dame sitting at six and one overall, three and one at home so far this season. Only loss coming to a very, very, very good Cincinnati team. Um, UNC sitting at four and three, three and three in the ACC, and obviously coming off a big, uh, dramatic, I should say, last minute kind of win against Miami. Um, and then obviously had the bye week last week. Now preparing for Notre Dame. So diving into Notre Dame, I'm gonna stay, I'm gonna stay on the offense real quick, and then we'll switch to the defense after. Um, number 89 total offense in the country, 370 yards per game for this club. Um, Jack Cohn, the starting quarterback for these guys, 120 um, uh, passes, 189, or excuse me, 120 completions out of 189 attempts, thrown for over 1,300 yards, 11 touchdowns, four interception. You also got Karen Williams at the running back position, 121 attempts, 508 yards, six touchdowns. The wide receiver to kind of look out for, statistically at least, Michael Mayer, 37 receptions, leads the team 414 yards, three touchdowns, 11.2 yards per um, reception as well. So a, a guy that can, you know, make some big plays when he when he does get the ball in his hands. So I know it's kind of a quick overview of this offense. We're not going to dive too much into it. But based on what you've seen from Notre Dame, what you've seen from Carolina defensively, looking at those stats as well, what do you think Carolina needs to do on the defensive side of the ball to, to have a chance to, to pull out a big win in South Bend on Saturday? Well, Carolina fans remember Karen Williams from last year. He's an NFL player. Big time. Uh, and and Myers probably one of the best tight ends, if not the best tight end in college football. Hmm. But, but Notre Dame has not moved the ball uh, exceptionally well. They're 89th in total offense for a reason. Yep. They're 115th in running the football, which is pretty amazing when you think about it. Hmm. Uh, they've allowed 26 sacks. And they're averaging 3.0 yards a rush. Now, if you remove those 26 sacks and look at the rest of the runs, they're averaging 4.1 yards a rush, which is not a lot. Mm 
No, it's not and good. overall, Notre Dame's averaging 5.2 yards in offensive play compared to Carolina averaging 6.8. So, you know, even, even the eruption game that Notre Dame had, which was against Wisconsin, they scored 41 points. And Wisconsin's got one of the top defenses in the country. But Notre Dame had an interception return for a touchdown and a kickoff return for a touchdown. So the Fighting Irish are not blazing up and down the field, racking up all kinds of things offensively. So what does that mean for Carolina's defense? Well, it means they're going up against a team that has not been all that prolific, but they have done that already this year and had issues. They made a very pedestrian Georgia Tech offense look fantastic for a half. They did the same thing with Florida State for two quarters and the same thing with Miami. So I think the onus is on the defense to stop allowing mediocre offenses to look way above mediocre. And that's why they lost two of those games, certainly why they lost the FSU game. If the defense was just average during those two quarters, Carolina would have won that game and they'd be five and two right now, but they didn't. Mm -hmm. And so the challenge this weekend is to not let Notre Dame be something it hasn't really been much this year. It moved the ball some against a lot against Florida state, but that was two months ago. Mm -hmm. So don't let Notre Dame stay out of character, force Notre Dame to remain in character. And that will then give Carolina's offense, which still has big strike ability doesn't have as many pieces, but they could still strike. That'll put them in position to strike big a few times and maybe be in position to win the game as they go into the fourth quarter. Most definitely, yeah. And just kind of diving in, I'm looking at some of the individual games that Notre Dame has played this year, looking at some of their kind of passing and rushing statistics. It's it's not super impressive. I mean, you're looking at, you know, what, seven games so far this year. I think they've thrown for over 200 yards twice and over 300 once rushing you're looking at the high numbers for rushing i've only ran for over 100 yards in the game one time so but but it's interesting too because you're looking at the points they're putting up against these teams and you know 41 against wisconsin only 13 against cincinnati in that loss 32 at, at in blacksbury against virginia tech 31 against usc i mean they played some good teams but they've also played some teams that you know virginia tech usc uh, you know, Purdue, 27 points against Purdue. I mean, good opponents, but nothing crazy. You know, not some of the opponents you're used to Notre Dame playing on a week-by-week basis where they're just playing some of the top teams in the in the country every year. But it's, it's an interesting – once you dive into it a little bit more, it's an interesting offense to look at because points-wise it's not horrible. But, you know, just looking at some of the high passing numbers and high rushing numbers, it, it, it's not very impressive statistically at least. What, what have been Carolina's problems on offense this year? Allowed too many sacks. Carolina's allowed 27. Notre Dame's allowed 26. Running the ball conventionally between the tackles, which they have actually made some improvements the last two games in. But Notre Dame has 754 yards rushing on the season. And you mentioned their top receivers. The first one you named was Meyer. He's a tight end. Carolina's tight ends have – look, the the second most targeted wide receiver for North Carolina is Emory Simmons with 26. So Sam's been sacked 27 times. The second most targeted receiver is 26 targets. So they have a lot of similar problems. I think the difference is that Carolina has a Josh Downs. I think the difference is Carolina has a Sam Howe. I think Carolina's run game is a little bit better, or at least it is shown to be better. Now, they play yeah. different. They played a couple of common opponents. They both lost in Blacksburg. Notre Dame probably should have won that game. Uh, Carolina, I think, rightfully lost its game up there, but they were far enough apart that it's probably not wise to draw many conclusions from that. Yeah. So I, I think you're looking at a team in Notre Dame that's older and they know how to win and they make plays. Now, one of the reasons they've had they've been very good is because they have Kyle Hamilton at safety, perhaps the best safety in college football, but he's not playing this weekend. The guy that's that's filling in for him, I was told by uh, some people who cover Notre Dame, they not very good. That they're very concerned. And in fact, someone who covers Notre Dame very closely told me off the record, I'm not going to reveal who this person is, that he's seriously considering picking North Carolina in this game because of their ability to hit those passes. I said, well, wait a minute. Sam's only hit like 10 passes, 20 yards or more downfield this year. It's not like he's doing what you've seen them do in the past. They've had to pick and pick and pick. You know, Josh Downs is in slot. You get him the ball. All his big, most of his big plays are with the legs after the catch. Mm -hmm. So uh, I do think this is an opportunity if the defense can play well. And for as much as we've beaten up the defense, Jacob, and Lord knows I've beaten them up a lot, especially going back to Atlanta. 
and deservedly so with the communication issues and some of the curious explanations that we've gotten for why things have not gone well. But I asked Jay Bateman Monday about the flip side of that. They've also had some really healthy stretches where the defense has been outstanding. They were outstanding against Duke. They were terrific in the first half against Miami. They were terrific in the first half against Georgia Tech. So what? It, who are they? Well, Bateman said, we would like to be the one that's been terrific, of course. And, and what is the difference? What's the constant when the defense has been terrific? Jeremiah Gemmel said it's energy. Guys play with better energy that when something bad happens, that they, they don't have the same spirit and energy, which is goes back to Mac talking about their struggles dealing with adversity on that side of the ball. Part of it is youth. Uh, Bateman said it's communication. So it comes back to communication. So I guess – If they communicate well for four quarters, then they'll have energy and spirit for four quarters and they'll make plays for four quarters and they'll get off the field on third down. Uh, That is the key. If they do those things on defense, they're going to have a chance to win this game. If they have two quarters like they did in Atlanta, like they did against FSU, like they did in the second half against Miami, then they stand no chance of competing and winning this game. Yeah. No, I couldn't. I couldn't agree more with that. It's. It's. It, you just never know what defense is going to show up. And I think most Carolina fans would agree with that. It, it, and not even just on a game by game basis. We've seen it on like a series, you know, like quarter, series. <laughs> yeah, series quarter, by series, yeah. quarter to quarter, half by half basis. So, it, I'm interested to see what defense shows up because, like I said, I think this Notre Dame offense is is solid, but statistically, at least from what I'm seeing and the research I've done, it. It's not great. It's not something you're looking at. I'm like, man, they've got, you know, I don't see any way Carolina defensively can stop them. I think they can. Just depends what defense shows up on Saturday in South Bend. So let's let's flip over the defensive side of the ball for Notre Dame real quick. Um, number 59 total defense in the country, actually allowing 370 yards per game. Like I said, Notre Dame on the offensive side of the ball is averaging 370 as well. So very similar in terms of the offensive defense and, and yards per game and what they're allowing. Um, I think it starts at the linebacker position. J.D. Bertrand leads the team in tackles, 65 tackles on the season. Big-time player at that linebacker position. You mentioned um, Kyle Hamilton as well. He's actually second on the team in tackles. So big miss um, with him and one of the better players on that uh, defensive side of the ball at that safety position. But, you know, defensive line, it's Isaiah Foskey, 7.5 sacks on the season. I mean, that's big-time numbers for a guy like him. I know he's a handful and with Carolina's offensive line struggles at times this year, and we've seen some improvements in, in spurts, it, he could be a handful for this team and somebody they're definitely going to have to watch out for. And I'm sure somebody, Sam Howell, will definitely have circled it as much as he's been hit at times this year as well. So defensively, it's, you know, solid defense, you know, not great sitting at kind of near that number 60 spot in, in terms of where they are in the country, but a decent defense, a solid defense that's got some playmakers on that side of the ball. But when you look at a guy like Hamilton being out, I think that adds a whole different dynamic to that uh, safety room, that defensive side of the ball for them. Focusing on that, though, AJ, switching over to Carolina, what does Carolina have to do, in your opinion, offensively to have a chance to win on Saturday in South Bend? Well, what jumps out about Notre Dame's defense is 19 sacks and 11 interceptions. Big time. So they make plays. Big time. You, You know, you can have a drive going, and next thing you know, you get a sack, put you in a second long or a third long, and then you get a pick mm-hmm. and it ends everything. So I, I, they have guys that stand, step up, make plays. Obviously Hamilton's one of them and he's not going to play, but this is Notre Dame. It's not like they're going to run, you know, someone from a uh, Hoggard high school out there. To, yeah, to, a bunch of walk-ons. And, I, and I'm giving a shout out to Hoggard because my niece. <laughs> yeah, shout out Hoggard. <laughs> <laughs> they're putting a dude out there. Yeah, maybe he's a dude not with it. He's not Kyle Hamilton, doesn't have the reps, maybe he doesn't have the pro stock, but he's still a dude. He's still a Notre Dame guy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but, but I tell you what, though, Notre Dame's 94th in the nation in passing yards allowed. Part of that's because they stopped the run so well. 31st in pass efficiency defense. Part of that's because of the 11 picks. So you're not looking at the 85 Bears on defense. So they're not going to wow you moving up and down the field with the ball. They're not going to wow you by simply shutting anybody they play down. They're very opportunistic. They know how to rise up and make big plays. And I do think the maturity and the smarts in this team and the coaching helps them get out of situations. And Carolina cannot help them in the, in the get out of those situations with penalties like we saw a lot the last couple of games, you know, hurting drives. We, you know, when Sam drops back to pass, 
He needs more than one guy to get open. If you only got one dude that might get open and the offensive line is so-so with protection, to me, that plays right into Notre Dame's hands mm -hmm. because the pass rush is there against other teams. The picks are there against other teams. Well, all that could line up and be a disaster for Carolina. So Carolina's going to have to run the ball well enough to not be in constant passing holes, which would play into Notre Dame's strength. And when the Tar Heels do pass, someone else has to get open. It, I don't think we're rewriting the script on what Carolina needs to do offensively here, Jacob. No. They've got to pass protect. Guys have to get open. I happen to think that the lack of receivers' ability to get open is just as big a problem with the sack, part of the sack problem, as the offensive line's protection. 100%. And as running backs. You know, a lot of people say, gosh, we'd love to see them get the ball to Ty Chandler more, but they need Chandler to block. Yeah. He's a guy that need to get the ball in space. Well, why don't you just throw a little flare out to him, get him in space, see what he can do. Mm -hmm. I do think the offense has kind of reached a point where get a guy the ball in space and see what they can do because a lot of things aren't consistently working. Mm -hmm. But Sam is Sam. Downs is downs. You know, I think we have a chance to maybe see a little more Bryce Nesbitt. We talked to Jay, uh, to Mac and uh, Phil Longo this week about some of the younger guys. It was around this time a year ago. When the defensive side of the ball inserted some young ones, Miles Murphy started playing more, Tony Grimes took over, Conley took over at nickel. Maybe we see something like that on the offensive side of the ball. Maybe we see a J.J. Jones on the field in the first quarter getting opportunities and seeing how that goes. Maybe Gavin Blackwell is out there. They said Kobe Paysauer, the other true freshman receiver, is coming along very well also. The bottom line is if guys can't get open, you got to try somebody else to see if they can't. Yeah. And that's what they need. So both teams, both sides of the ball have the same issues. And if the negative things occur Saturday night on both sides of the ball, they're not going to win. If they play over that and the offense has shown an ability more often than the defense has to play at a higher end, if they could do that, they put themselves in position to win. It's all about playing better, yeah, trimming the bad stuff, having more of the good stuff. And if they do that Saturday night, I don't think Notre Dame – is such an overwhelming, daunting task for this team that they can't manage it. Mm -hmm. I agree. I think it's a winnable game. And that kind of transitioned to the last thing I want to ask you real quickly before we go into the prediction and, and, and wrap this thing up. Uh, just uh, looking at where Carolina's – the struggles they've had in the first half of the season, coming off a, a good win over Miami in the fashion that they did, heading into a very, very tough stretch of games, a, a second half of the season, which we've talked about many times that's, you know, on paper at least, and I think anybody would agree is harder than what they faced in the first half of the season in terms of the opponents they're facing. Just how big of an opportunity and how big of a game is this for Carolina when you look at, like I said, what's happened and, and what they're kind of going into? Because for me, a win over Notre Dame in South Bend can really give this team a little bit more belief, a little bit more minimum, momentum, excuse me, going into some really tough games down the stretch. Well, I think it's an opportunity to validate some of the things that were said that this team could become before the season starts. I don't think they're looking at it that way. I think they're looking at it as an opportunity to improve. And I think they know that they could change the narrative very quickly. Yeah. And the narrative has been, if you look at the three most disappointing teams in college football this year, I think they're all in the ACC, Jacob. Agreed. It begins with Clemson. I think Miami is next. I think third is North Carolina. North Carolina might be next. Depends on what happens in the next five weeks. Mm -hmm. If they go one and four, then maybe they leapfrog Miami. And uh, maybe they're number two or even number one, depending on how Clemson finishes out. I think it's 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 not a uh, – it does. It's not doing a disservice to this team to say that they've been a disappointment. They know they have. Yeah. Mac has talked a couple of times about the players feel like they've let the fan base down. And, and I wrote a column that by the time this podcast runs, I'm not sure if the column's been posted or not. But, you know, for the first time this season, they're going to go into a game Saturday night without pressure. Mm -hmm. They had pressure going to Blacksburg because they had a lot to live up to. And they absolutely laid an egg. And ever since then, the, they've had a, they've had mounting pressure probably the least amount of pressure they had going into a game was Atlanta when they went down to Georgia tech. And that was after they put 59 up on the board back to back against Georgia state and Virginia. And a lot of us thought, okay, they're finding themselves. Georgia tech shouldn't be an issue, but Georgia tech was an issue. Mm -hmm. And I think this team has been one of the reasons they haven't handled adversity. Well, and they got very tight, mm -hmm. but now 
this is a four and three North Carolina who never lives up to the hype going into South Bend to take on Notre Dame in front of touchdown Jesus. Notre Dame's won 37 straight against unranked teams, 27 of the last 28 at home. The only loss was to the number two team in the country. So North Carolina has no chance. Nobody's going to give them a chance outside of a few of us who cover the team and know them and maybe understand Notre Dame pretty well. And a couple of the guys that covered Notre Dame, no one's going to give them a chance to win this game. And because of that, they're going to have no pressure. They're going to be loose going into a game. And when you're loose, I think you think clear more, uh, yeah. more clearly. Oh, yeah. I think when you're loose, you're quicker. You're more reactive. I think when you're when, and when those things happen, the hands catch balls a little bit better. I think the routes are run a little bit better. I think the pre-snap communication is a little bit better because you're not as tense. You're not as tight. So that all being said, there is a chance for a lot of things to line up and this team to actually play a little bit more to the potential it has play, uh, we have, than we have seen so far this year. And if they do that, they have a chance to win this game. And if they win a game like this, they can really change the way we view the close of the season. Because this begins a three-game stretch over 12 days where they play number 11 on the road. They host the current number 13 in the home, and they'll be at number 11 or 10 when right. Wake Forest comes in. And then five days after that, they go to Pitt, who, who's ranked. They have maybe the guy who eventually wins the Heisman Trophy. I think the best player in college football, Kenny Pickett, mm -hmm. and that's on the road on a Thursday night. Those three and 12 days, they have a chance to really flip the narrative in a big way here in the next couple of weeks, or they have a chance to let people shovel more dirt on top of them. Yeah. And Max said, look, you guys can do that. You could totally shift the narrative. You could change the narrative. You can you could close out your season in a totally different trajectory than the way things are right now, or it continues to down to to spiral downward. It's up to you guys, and it's up to us. So we'll see. Mm -hmm. It's a great opportunity. Jeremiah Gimmel said, "What a, you know? You couldn't have asked for a better opportunity to try to." resurrect what has been a disappointing season with what they have left and throw in state there at the end of the year states ranked in one of the polls and yep. state's a good football team and they'll be that'll be a damn hornet's nest when they go in there the day after thanksgiving so they got some big time challenges in front of them but it's also a big time opportunity we'll see what they do yeah it'd be interesting to see what happens perfect segue into our prediction time which we do at every <laughs> end of all of our preview podcasts our favorite time of the week i think to just see how wrong we're going to be on saturday um i said 38 28 notre dame aj the reason i say that and I've, i wrote this in our staff picks which you'll see later this week I, i'm just at a point where i haven't seen enough from this team to think they can go to south bend and win i, I think they have the talent not only on offense but on defense and they have the ability to go up there and do it. I, there wouldn't be a surprise to me necessarily. I wouldn't be shocked for lack of a better word, if they went up there and found a way to win, I think they have that. I just haven't seen enough from this team to think that a, they're going to be able to stop Notre Dame. I know it's not a crazy elite offense or anything like that, but playing at home, the ups and downs, the uh, Jekyll and Hyde we've seen from this defense. I think they're going to let up some points. Carolina offensively has still struggled. I know they had a good game against Miami, but what offense is going to show up in South Bend? We don't know. So I'm, I'm taking the easy way out, I guess I should say, and, and predicting a 10-point loss for, for Carolina up there. But like I said, it wouldn't be a surprise to me if they found a way to win necessarily. What, what about you, AJ? What, what are you thinking right now? Well, I think the best way to project the future is to fully understand the past. What did Shakespeare say? Past is prologue. That was good stuff um, right there. That's good stuff. So in their, who have they beaten in their four wins? Georgia State's a mess. Yep. All right. Uh, Duke's a mess. Yep. Miami is a disorganized mess. <laughs> okay. And, and I'm not, look, I'm not trying it's to be true, funny though. or anything, but it's true. And then he beat Virginia. We, we, you know, Virginia's got a great opportunity going to BYU this weekend. Mm. So maybe Virginia is actually a good win. The five and two right now, the Wahoos are scoring points. Yeah, they got a phenomenal quarterback in Ronald Armstrong. Carolina won that game. They were awesome offensively that night with 59 points, but they also allowed someone to throw for 73 more yards than anyone had ever thrown for against North Carolina <laughs> that night. So even in their best win, their only good win, there were still a lot of things to pick at. So mm -hmm. that's what we've seen so far. They, they've lost to a Virginia Tech team that's going to fire its coach. They lost to a Florida State team whose coaches, you know, he's they won three in a row, but look who they played in some of those games. And I, we don't really know what FSU is. They're not very good right now. And they lost to a Georgia Tech team that, you know, is kind of waddling along, trying to get, you know, Jeff Collins is still trying to build that thing. So yeah. 
what we've seen is not very impressive. So based on that, I cannot pick them to go up to Notre Dame and win. But I will say it would not surprise me. I do think this is a potentially solid matchup for Carolina because of the opportunities that they could exploit. But I also think if they don't play really well, their weaknesses play into Notre Dame strengths. And, it, and it, if it's going to get ugly, it'll get ugly in favor of Notre Dame. Yeah. I think they'll be competitive, but they're just not going to make enough plays to win. That's my prediction. Yeah, I completely agree with what you said, like I usually do. But that was that was spot on. Very similar to kind of my thought process. You, you can't just – based on what we've seen this year, you can't just be like, oh, yeah, Carolina's going to go up there and win. I mean, they could, and I wouldn't be surprised, like you said, if they did. But it, it, it's just not enough sample size this year to really think that's a – Something that'll legitimately happen. So, yeah. What would say? How many times have you been up to Notre Dame, AJ? This will just well for football. Second, this will third. be my second. This will be my second for football. Nice. I was up there in fourteen when Notre Dame beat the Tar Heels fifty to forty five, which is still it's the highest scoring game ever played in that stadium, which is truly remarkable. I call it the Shopper game. It was Jeff Shopper yeah, that had to pick six, exactly and I still it, yeah. think that picture is on his Twitter. It's got to be. So it should be. It should be forever. Yeah, yeah that's big time. Yeah, Marquise caught a touchdown pass, I think, up there. Um, uh, Quinshot Davis threw it to him. So that was a hell of a game. really good off. They, they couldn't stop their name to save their lives, which yeah. was a pretty common theme during that era. That's a good point. So, <laughs> but I've been up there three times or four times for basketball, and this will be my second for football. So I'm looking forward to it. I'm, I'm getting deeper into my career, so I don't know how many more t- times I'll have an opportunity to get back there. So I'm going to fully enjoy the historical component of this trip and it oozes history and i appreciate i love college football history love baseball history so i get the college football side there with this one oh yeah um and if anybody's going up there for the first time make sure you go you walk the perimeter of the stadium because at each gate it's named after one of their legendary coaches and there's a statue of the coaches and my my one of my favorite things about the game in 2014 and i hope i see somebody wearing these shirts saturday uh, if, uh, Lou Holtz shirt. I know what you're about to it just say. says Lesh L E S H go. Lesh go. <laughs> it's fantastic. That's awesome. And if I see someone in them, I'm going to take a picture. That's awesome. That's fantastic. Yeah. And, and if you guys, yeah, wanna... if any Carolina fans are going up there for the first time, get there early hmm. and just spend time, uh, walk around, soak it all in. It's a special, special place. If you see that T-shirt for sale, AJ, go ahead and buy me one. I'll pay you back for it. That's that's fantastic. That'll be your compensation <laughs> for November's work. How about that? Hey, that's 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 awesome stuff right there, man. That's a great T-shirt. Let's go. Phenomenal. That, <laughs> that's awesome. Oh, that's great. I, I love that one. I'll have to see if they got that one online, too. That's fantastic. But, uh, yeah, and if you guys, obviously, with AJ being up there, I know he'll be tweeting a lot of pictures and videos before the game as well. So check us out on – at Heel Illustrated on Twitter, if you want to see all that stuff leading up to the game, and of course, keep it locked to Tar Heel Illustrated. Yeah, and if anybody sees, if everybody sees me, say hey. Tell yeah, me yeah, come up and say hi to AJ. I know it's uh, it, it'd be a great experience for him. I know he's been up there a few times, but you know that's a pretty hallowed ground in college football, so you don't you don't get to go. That, there. It's more hallowed than Yankee Stadium because they don't have the old Yankee Stadium anymore. Yeah, great Yankee point. Stadium, so great point. And to me, Notre Dame football and, and Yankees baseball are kind of the pinnacle in terms of all that stuff in this country, and so this is pretty cool stuff. Most definitely. Most definitely, AJ. We'll say travels up there, man. Enjoy it up there. We'll, we'll see what happens on the football field, but a, a cool trip nonetheless. That's going to do it for us, though. I've been Jacob Turner. He's been Andrew Jones. Make sure you guys keep it locked to tarlillustrate.com, especially with the leak weeding up to the game. Head on over there before the game. Uh, get involved in our uh, premium group chat as well, our live chat during the game that we do. Uh, we have a thread that we do for every game, so it'll be posted on the front during it as well. So if you're a premium subscriber, and if you're not, go ahead and get signed up for 833 a month. But Make sure you head on over there, get involved in the chat during the game. I think we've been averaging a couple thousand every game in there. So we've had a, a you know, with 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 uh, responses and everything. So we've had a good little community over there that gets involved on a, on, on a game-by-game basis. So check that out and sign up. You can find the link in the description below to head on over to our website. But as usual, guys, like, share, subscribe, hit that notification bell as well. And we'll see you guys in the next one. Thanks. Thanks.